Hi folks. So in video one of this set of lectures, we discussed the structure of the plasma membrane or cell membrane, that it's a phospholipid bilayer that has embedded proteins, uh, carbohydrates, and steroids. In this video, we're gonna go over passive transport across the cell membrane. Um, and I'll introduce you to the difference between passive and active transport. So first thing to remember is that cells are, the cytosol or um, cytoplasm is primarily water with embedded organelles and dissolved ions and monomers. The cell's also surrounded by extracellular fluid. Sometimes this is also called tissue fluid or interstitial fluid. Two ways, things, two general ways things move across the cell membrane. Passive transport and active transport. Now sometimes uh, people will say passive transport doesn't require energy, but whenever things are moving, there's a source of energy. So it's not that energy isn't required, but that the cell does not have to provide the energy. Essentially, it doesn't have to pay for it. Um, the movement of molecules is powered by differences in concentration. And we'll talk more about that in this video. Active transport, the cell has to pay for the movement of things. The cell membrane is described as selectively permeable. Um, to permeate means to pass through, and selective implies that um, there's a selection happening. Sometimes this is also described uh, as semi-permeable. So only some molecules can move across the cell membrane um, based on differences in concentration without the help of other molecules. And that's a fairly limited group of, of things that can freely pass through. It includes carbon dioxide, CO2, oxygen gas, and steroids. You notice all of these are nonpolar. They're also small. So what can't cross? Well, ions, charged particles, uh, polar monomers like amino acids and glucose, and finally large macromolecules like proteins as is shown here. You'll notice that I've got water in this diagram. Um, a small amount of water can diffuse through the cell membrane. And there are other s molecules that have slight polarity, like um, ethanol, which is the alcohol um, in beer and wine and other spirits. Um, but most, most water actually requires the help of a special protein to get across the cell membrane. And that's shown here. So if you have a specific carrier transport channel protein, some of the substances that we've talked about can be imported into the cell. A couple things to keep in mind here. The first is that the movement of molecules with passive transport is based on differences in concentration inside the cell versus outside the cell. We describe this as a concentration gradient. The second thing to keep in mind is that each channel is selective in terms of what molecules it will allow to pass through it. So you are not able to pass a negative ion, for example, through a channel that's specialized 
from the movement of positive ions. Remember, everything depends on shape. Now, all of these methods of passive transport are one form or another of diffusion. Diffusion is the result of the random bumping around of molecules, right? So all matter is constantly in motion, and the closer you are to a gas from a solid, remember solid liquid gases, the faster the molecules are moving, which means the faster things are going to diffuse. The movement of molecules is always from an area where the, the molecule in question is more concentrated, which means you have more per unit area, uh, to an area where it's less concentrated. And that will continue until everything is equally distributed. Anything that can move around um, that's not prevented by a barrier is going to do this. So a bit of background vocabulary. Um, in the image here, we've got two um, beakers and we've got water shown with the darker blue circles and uh, a, a dye molecule shown with the red. The names aren't important. The red molecules are described as the solute, primarily because there are fewer of them. Um, the darker blue, the water, is the solvent. And once the dye has spread throughout the water until it's equal, equally distributed, we say that the red has dissolved. And the total mixture at the end is referred to as a solution. When we talk about concentration, right, that's a, cri a critical idea for understanding passive transport. Um, concentration is a ratio of how much solute you have for a given volume of solvent. When we have a concentration gradient, what we have is a ratio of ratios. So you've got solute over solvent compared to solute over solvent. So and that's what's showed in this image. So at the top time zero, we have small uncharged molecules of phospholipid bilayer. At time one, we can see that those molecules, small uncharged molecules, have moved across the phospholipid bilayer into the cytoplasm of the cell. And by the end of the process, oops, it's not working, there we go, um, we have roughly equal numbers on both sides. Right now, even when you have same number of particles on both sides, um, the movement will continue. It's, it's just that there will be no net movement to, in one direction or the other. There are a couple of things that can affect how fast diffusion occurs. The first is the concentration gradient, the ratio of ratios. So the greater the difference in concentration in two areas or across a membrane, the faster diffusion will occur. Right? Think of it, think of a concentration gradient sort of like a gravitational gradient. The steeper a hill is, all right, the um, the faster a ball rolling down is gonna is gonna pick up speed. The, another factor is temperature. So the higher the temperature is, that remember temperature is a measurement of how fast particles are moving. It's also movement energy is described as kinetic energy. So the faster they're moving, that is the higher the temperature the faster diffusion and mixture will occur. And then finally, when we're talking about living systems, 
the more cell membrane you have <clears throat> separating two areas, um, the more surface area you have for diffusion to occur across, and that's going to cause the rate to be faster. We'll see when we talk, start to talk about the digestive system, a number of other um, organs in the body are structured to increase the surface area of the cells to increase diffusion. So why do we care about diffusion? Well, your liver is your detox, your main detox organ, and it creates a molecule called urea, which is primarily considered waste. That diffuses from the high concentration that you see within the liver cells to the much lower concentration in the blood. And then from there, the urea is again filtered out based on concentration in the kidneys, right? When that process doesn't work, um, you're essentially stewing in your own poison. It's so another great example of how our bodies use diffusion is the exchange of oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas in the lungs between the, the, um, the inside of the air sacs of the lungs, which are also referred to as alveoli. Right There's higher concentration of oxygen in the air that we inhale and there's very low CO2 or carbon dioxide level. The opposite is true in the blood vessels that surround the air sacs in the lungs. And so the different concentration gradients mean that CO2 will move into the air sac of the lung and the oxygen gas will move out and into the blood. All right, so we have diffusion of small nonpolar molecules directly across the cell membrane. The next thing we're going to talk about is osmosis, a phenomenon called osmosis. <clears throat> osmosis is essentially a special case of diffusion. Because the chemistry of life is based on water, this process is critically important and so it gets its own term. So osmosis, the technical definition is diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Could be a cell membrane, could be the membrane provided by dialysis tubing. Based on differences in solute concentrations inside versus outside the cell. Remember, concentration is the ratio of solute to solvent. So we're going to talk about the ratio of solute to solvent outside the cell and compare that to the ratio of solute to solvent inside the cell. All right, so in the image on the left, we have a, a beaker of water with a semi-permeable membrane right down the middle, splitting the beaker into two sides. On one side, we've got a little bit of sugar and a lot of water. And on the other side, separated by this membrane, you have much more sugar and a lower concentration of water. Right? What One really key point with understanding osmosis is that the higher the solute concentration, the lower the water concentration is. So this is the starting point. What happens next is that if those sugar molecules can't move across the semi-permeable membrane and the water can, the water is going to bump around until, until you have equal concentrations on both sides. And that force is strong enough that what you observe actually as the water molecules move is that one, the water on one side of the beaker is pushed up 
compared to the other, even though it can move freely back and forth. And that tells us that that force is, is uh, stronger than gravity. All right, so that's shown sort of the beginning and end states are shown in this diagram. You can see that at the beginning of the process and the beaker on the left, on the left side, you have a lot of solvent water, which is the peach color, and a tiny bit of solute, which is the purple. On the right side of the left beaker, you have a lot more solute, and correspondingly, you have less solvent. That sets up a concentration gradient, so that over time, you have the results shown on the right. You have equal concentration of the solute to solvent, equal ratios on both sides of the semi-permeable membrane. We use the term tonicity, think tone, to compare this, the solute concentration surrounding a cell to the concentration inside that cell, right? And we always define it with respect to concentration outside the cell. When you change the tonicity of a solution around the cell, you change the environment around the cell and absolutely will change the cell. So the first way we describe tonicity is to say that a solution can be isotonic to the cell. So the prefix iso means same, tonic think tone, concentration, same concentration inside the cell and outside the cell. So if it, the concentration is the same, water will be moving in and water will be moving out of the cell. And that's what these arrows represent. So the cell, there's no net loss, no net gain of water. And so the cell goes about its business. For animal cells, we always use red blood cells as an example because they have such a unique shape. So red blood cell is described as a biconcave disc um, because you've got the um, sort of, it's like a donut, but it, there's actually a tiny bit of dough in the donut hole. And if we cut a red blood cell and look at it from the side, it looks sort of like a modified dog bone. Um, so it's really easy to see if the cell takes on water, right? It's going to become more round and plump. And on the other hand, if you lose water, the cell is going to shrink down in a really interesting way. All right, so isotonic means that the solution outside the cell has the same concentration as the cytosol. The next way we describe solutions around cell is to say that a solution can be hypotonic. So the prefix hypo means low. So low concentration, low tone outside the cell. The key to understanding how water will move in hypotonic and hypertonic solutions is to remember that we describe solute concentration or just des describe the concentration of a solution as a ratio of solute to solvent. So if you have say 2% solution outside the cell and 4% inside the cell, and let's assume that that 2 and 4% of solute can't cross the membrane that sets us up where we've got 98% water outside the cell and 96% water inside the cell. If the outside of the cell has more water than the inside, water will be pulled in, will be drawn in. Right, so water is always gonna move from 
hypotonic to hypertonic, right? And when we're comparing something like these, my pretend solutions here, um, the inside of the cell, if the outside is hypotonic, then the inside is hypertonic in comparison. And notice that um, the, in both the photomicrographs of the blood cells and the way they're drawn here, that they look a, a lot more plump. When you have a hypertonic solution, the solution outside the cell is higher than the solution inside the cell. This is where it's important to remember that tonicity is always relative. And by that I mean, if the solution surrounding the cell is hypertonic, that means the cytoplasm is hypotonic and water moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. With red blood cells, that means that, well, with all animal cells, it means that the cell is going to shrink or shrivel up. It's a phenomenon called crenation. Plant cells are a little bit different, right? So they, plant cells have a cell membrane and a cell wall, um, and so they don't, um, they don't explode as easily if they're in really hypotonic solutions um, and they don't uh, completely collapse, um, at least not initially if they're in hypertonic solutions. All right, so let's say I throw a red blood cell into each of these solutions. Hyper, hypo, and isotonic. Remember, water always moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. So it's pretty easy to figure out that when you have a hypotonic solution, the water, more water is going to move in than moves out. And if it's isotonic, water is going to move both ways. So with the isotonic, you're not going to have a lot of change. With the hypotonic around it, the cell is going to plump up. The place people usually get jammed up is with hypertonic solutions. Remember, we're defining tonicity with respect to the outside of the cell. So if the solution on the outside is hypertonic, that means that inside the cell is hypotonic, relatively speaking, and so water is going to be drawn out of the cell, and we're going to end up with a crenated, shriveled up cell. So why does osmosis matter? Well, that's how our cells access the water that they need for metabolism. Um, and animal cells, unlike plant cells, don't have a rigid cell wall. And so they're very sensitive to changes in tonicity, changes in concentration of the extracellular or tissue fluid. Right, so the reason that we use isotonic saline in IVs, for the most part use isotonic, is because you would destroy the most common cell in the blood um, if you put in a hypertonic or a hypotonic solution. Um, and there's only so much water the inside of the cell can accommodate before the cell membrane is going to disintegrate. I want to let you guys look at this review video. The link is um, in your PowerPoint. The last kind of diffusion we're going to talk about is referred to as facilitated transport or facilitated diffusion. So it's diffusion for two reasons, because molecules move from an area of higher to lower concentration, and it doesn't require ATP hydrolysis, ATP use, right? So 
the molecules move with the concentration gradient from high to low. The way that it's different from osmosis is that we're not talking about the transport of water, usually, and we're also um, not talking about materials that can diffuse freely across the membrane. So when you have charged particles, very polar molecules, you need the help of a protein carrier or a transporter in order to move things across the membrane, even when you have a concentration gradient, right? You can have a big concentration gradient, but if it's something that's that can't diffuse by itself across the membrane, it's not coming in. So to facilitate means to help, and that's why we we're using the term facilitated diffusion. All right, so quick review. Passive transport. Movement of materials is based on a concentration gradient. So whatever the ma material is you're talking about, moving, whether it's carbon dioxide or oxygen or uh, glucose or ions or amino acids, materials always moving from where there's more of it to where there's less. So diffusion occurs when we have small nonpolar molecules and a concentration gradient of those molecules. Osmosis refers to the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane, and that's where tonicity comes in. Facilitated diffusion refers to situations when we're moving large polar molecules into or out of the cell using specialized pores or carrier transport proteins that are embedded in the membrane.